Uh, we want to say good morning uh, to our internet friends. Uh, we love them all across the world, wherever you are. And it may not be Father's Day wherever you're at, Abe. I'm sure that in India it's probably not Father's Day. But uh, we pray God's blessing upon you and your family anyway. And all the rest of you, wherever you are, uh, bless the Lord. It is, it is very good. Uh, a week from today, our young people will leave here as soon as we say amen. And I don't know how many, did I see uh, Carol or Dave or Lori, one of you, how many, how many are going all together? We have 33 teenagers, and we think 11 adults, 33 and 11, 64. Okay? So, uh, so uh, up to 44 people potentially getting on the road next Sunday morning as soon as we say amen. That is a gigantic undertaking and they will be heading across to Missouri, then down to Arkansas, then back home. So be praying for them and getting ready to go. Be praying for them as they leave and be praying as they travel. Uh, they have done these trips now several times and they do great organizational work, but we all know anything can happen when you're driving the highway. So, uh, be praying, not only for a safe and wonderful time, but be praying that they have an impact, that they have an impact. Last time when they were at the Ark a year ago, uh, they had a gigantic impact. People kept coming to them, talking to them, expressing their appreciation because they will all be wearing identical shirts so that they can be identified and, and people kept noticing that group and, and what a wonderful thing. So uh, that happens next week. What a wonderful thing that is. We're, we're tickled for it. Uh, we're tickled for it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in 52 years of raising kids, I have become very acquainted with, uh, it can't be done. It's impossible. Those are standard lines that I have heard uh, for 52 years. And as a result, I have responded with, all things are possible to those who believe in Christ. You know, with God's help, all things are possible. Uh, but with God, all things are possible. So, uh, with that, I have, spent, I have spent many years simply trying to demonstrate to young people, no, I know that looks impossible, but it can be done. So, my most recent endeavor was what I called my playhouse, my cabin. Well, it's done. It's finally done. I finished it, uh, I don't know, Tuesday or Wednesday, it got done. It's done. It's done. And uh, my point, my point, our economy's gone wild in the last couple of years. Money is worth nothing. Uh, uh, your money is worth nothing. Uh, Fred just told us he paid nearly $400 for an impeller on a stupid water pump. Ah, everything has gone wild, everything has gone wild. Uh, so, with all the kids that we raise over there, young people uh, are now told that a starter home costs $400,000 in America. The, not, in Cody, not in Lovell, Wyoming, I can tell you that. But the average, the average American starter home is $400,000. Levon and I started in a cabin of 300 square feet that we built for less than $1,000. And we were comfortable, uh, more comfortable in the summer than in the winter because I couldn't afford to chink the logs. And so you could see through. And in the winter, it wasn't as comfortable as it was in the summer, it was air cooled. Yes, in the summer it was air cooled, but we actually lived in it for less than a thousand dollars. So I wanted to find out what's it going, what's it cost today? It's impossible for kids to get married and live any place. And so I started out simply to prove. Well, I can tell you, uh, 392 square feet 
costs $15,586. That's what it costs. Instead of $400 or 350 a square foot, it's a little under $40 a square foot. And uh, I use blue pine and cedar and, and uh, steel uh, uh, wainscoting. Uh, so uh, open house over there today if you want to drive over while I'm gone. The boys put a nice stairway there. Go look. I even put my mounted polar bear in there. Uh, go over. Take a look. You're welcome to see it. But the goal is that, hey, you can do something. $15,000 wouldn't even buy a horse at Ken Sale. But it bought this cabin. So that's, that project is done. The windows are not in it, but they're paid for. I'm not going to put the windows in it until I figure out where I'm going to move it. I've been thinking about the parking lot here. I don't know where I'm going to put it. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't got a clue. But I did it to find out if it could be done. I'm thankful, and Levon and I could move in it tomorrow, and we could be happy. So anyway, that was my, my most recent uh, run at what can be done. Now let's turn to 737. 727. 727. <clears throat> Seven hundred forty. Seven hundred forty. Joy unspeakable. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Number 10, and stand together. Number 10. <clears throat>
cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Thank you, guys. You did beautiful. Cynthia's saying, wow, next time we'll practice first. <laughs> they did wonderful without having an opportunity to get together. That was great. Thank you so very much. That was great. Uh, we're working our way through these five sermons called The Road to Revolution. The Road to Revolution. Uh, is it possible, is it possible that the revolution should have never happened? Is it possible that God blessed the revolution? Uh, that's the question we're looking at and have been looking at uh, for two pre previous weeks. And we look at it this week and then on we go. Uh, the, uh, the two books that I'm... You, that, 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 that are, are referenced mostly behind this sermon. Uh, Peter Marshall, the great Peter Marshall, and David Manuel took American history. They call it God's Plan for America. It's called The Light and the Glory. That's the first book. Uh, they, they, there are three books this thick that, that just get you up to the Civil War. Uh, uh, they take the American history and they cut it apart one sliver at a time uh, based on how it fits in with God's word and how God uh, brought it forward. And so uh, I'll be looking at that. I've looked at that endlessly this week. Also, uh, uh, every time I come up against a question that I can't find the answer to, I either have Levon check with Siri or I have Justin find me a book. And... Uh, after, after reading a while, I knew I needed to read more about George Whitfield. And, uh, and Justin found me this uh, 1972 copy of, uh, of a biography of George Whitfield. And uh, those are the two books that uh, I used here, uh, largely. Uh, and, uh, and 15 different encyclopedias, which you can find yourself. But uh, I'm going to read a a page from each of these before we're done uh, this morning. Uh, I'm, I can tell you this is a story that I was never told in high school or college. I was never told this story. Uh, I, I, you get one paragraph called The Great Awakening. And basically, a bunch of Christians were sleeping in church when somebody came in and slammed the piano cover down, and that was the end of the Great Awakening. <laughs> that's all the more you get. That's all the more I ever got. Even in Christian college, that's all the more I ever got. Um, so uh, I found this an incredible story, and I hope that I am able in some small measure to give it justice in trying to tell it to you. Uh, I, I hope that I can... Uh, uh, get it to you in a way that helps you to understand what happened. Father, oh Lord, we love you this morning. We love what you have allowed us to do. We love the fact that the providence of God works in the hearts of individuals and in the hearts and nations and directs the affairs of mankind, sometimes when we're right and sometimes when we're wrong. But God, you lead us along. And we thank you for that, Lord, and we pray that in all of our doings, we would honor you. Lord, I pray that the things that I share this morning bring new light into our, art, into our eyes and into our hearts, that we are better able to understand a part of our history that we know very little about. So bless these moments, Lord, in your name I pray. Amen. If you... Uh, if you go to southern Maine, 
jump on I-95 in southern Maine and 1,400 miles south of there, you will hit the Florida border still on I-95. And uh, the average 20-year-old will drive it in 20 hours. Me, three-day trip. But the average 20-year-old will do it 20 hours and say, well, that was wonderful. But you've covered 1,400 miles and you have touched every single one of the 13 original colonies on I-95. It, it includes them all. It makes a loop so that it doesn't leave any of them out. You will have done it all. The question we're dealing with is how could those 13 colonies ever say God led us into revolution? That's the question we're working on. Uh, next week's topic will be called when kings become tyrants, that'll be next week. When kings become tyrants, and we'll actually look next week at the scripture, uh, Romans 13, 1 and 2, submit unto all the authorities, and we'll look at the scripture that the colonists looked at as well. We'll do that next week. But for now, I'm still going to hold you in wonder. I'm still going to hold you without giving you really answers. Uh, we've got 13 colonies. 13 different land arrangements with different kings. Most of the colonies were business ventures. The majority were business ventures. They were there to make money. They were there to generate income. They were, the goal was to generate income, to send back to England, to keep the mother country strong and happy. Some of the colonies were not. Some of them were religiously oriented. Maryland was a product of the Calvert family, or it was, a, it was under the guidance of the Calvert family, who were English Catholics. And Catholics in England had a very hard time, and so they needed a place to escape to. And so the Calvert family got uh, permission to start Maryland, and it became the Catholic colony. Massachusetts was filled with separatists and with the, with the Puritans. Rhode Island. Rhode Island, he was a renegade Purits, a Puritan, Roger Williams. He was a Puritan that couldn't get along with the Puritans. So uh, he became the father of Rhode Island. Pennsylvania, William Penn. That was a very interesting story, William Penn. William Penn was the son of William Penn, who was a great general and fought a great battle for the king of England and the king of England ended up owing Sir William Penn a great debt and he literally this was the only one of the 13 colonies that was really a gift of land it wasn't a charter where you owe me something back it was a literal deed to the land of Pennsylvania written to William Penn's uh, Sir William Penn's son, William Jr. Now, William Jr. was a rebel, a, a religious rebel. He was a scoundrel, a rebel. I mean, he was a Quaker. He, they, he, he became identified with the Quakers. And uh, at one point, he was thrown in jail in the Tower of London for eight months. He got out of there because he was a Quaker. That's all he did wrong. But when he got out, they accused him of trying to start a riot like, like Trump on January 6th. Uh, he tried to start a riot, and so they brought him back, and they were going to put him in prison again. They had a trial for him. They had a trial, and the jury found him innocent. So what did the judge do? He put the entire jury in jail. Yeah, yeah. When the jury found him innocent, they put the jury in jail, and it took the English Supreme Court to get the jury out of jail. So, he got given a gift, the land of Pennsylvania. That's how Pennsylvania got going. Georgia. Georgia was started by George Og Og Oglethorpe. Say that word twice fast. <laughs> I can't say it once slowly. Uh, George Oglethorpe. And it was a place for the people in debtor's prison in England. So, it was a poor man's palace. Uh, 
They brought over people from the debtor's prison and started Georgia. It was the last of the 13 colonies started in 1732. So it really got started late. Now the colonies had very little interaction. They were each completely separate, completely on their own. They really were filled with rivalry and jealousy. They were not in any way a unit in the 1730s. They simply were not. Now, <coughs> there was almost no north and south travel. The travel was all east and west. In all of the colonies, the goal was to get to their ocean seaport because every colony had an ocean seaport. You say, McNabb, you don't even know your geography. Pennsylvania is landlocked. The only way you can get out of Pennsylvania by water is go to Lake Erie and come out the St. Lawrence Seaway. Well, that's right. That's true. But that means you looked at the history after 1776 when they declared statehood and drew the lines differently. When they were a colony, they had a seaport out through Delaware. So every colony had its own seaport and they connected to England. So travel was all east and west. There was no north and south travel that would sew the colonies together. There was no unifying factor among the colonies. Now by 1730, most of the colonies, not Georgia, because it wasn't even a colony yet, another two years, and then it struggled for a number of years, but most of the colonies by 1730 were very prosperous. They were doing well. Have you ever noticed that prosperity can be an enemy of faith? Prosperity can be an enemy to faith. Too much easy times can cause you to slack up on your dependence upon God. Uh, used to have a man spend a lot of time praying for Fort Shiloh. He was always praying, a wonderful man. You knew Stan Campbell. Loved old Stan Campbell. Uh, he was always praying in our early years, 50 years ago, Stan would be praying that somebody would give us a million dollars. That was his prayer. And finally one day I told Stan, I said, Stan, quit praying for a million dollars. There's no way in the world I could handle a million dollars. Yeah. Uh, too much money can jeopardize your faith, and it did that in the colonies. It did that in the colonies. So by 1730, even the Puritans, even the Puritans by 1730 had lost their zeal. Some colonies never had any, but the ones that did have had fallen backwards. Now, now I want to flash back to the Reformation, 1517. In 1517, remember, the Reformation changed the whole world. Martin Luther <coughs> stumbles onto the verse, Romans 1:17. now the just shall live by faith. And that line changed the world. Uh, Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 starts with the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, a, a, a religious teacher who came to Jesus by night. Knowing, in other words, he didn't want to be seen publicly because he was a Pharisee. Yet he, he comes to Jesus and he says... Because of the miracles you do, we know you must be from God. Now, the Pharisees weren't admitting that, but he was. He was admitting it. He said, because of the great miracles you do, we know you must come from God. Jesus cuts right to the chase, and he says in verse 3, he says, I'll tell you this. I tell you the truth. No man can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Whew, that blew Nicodemus out of the water. Uh, sir, born again? I mean, he says, how, sir, 
Sir, how can a man be born again when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Man, you've lost your mind. This can't happen. <laughs> to which Jesus says, I'll tell you the truth. No man can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water, physically, and of the Spirit. Wow. Jump over to Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> verse 9. <coughs> Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Here Paul says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Huh? Yeah. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Wow. Wow. Uh, you mean born again is, that's born again. That's born again. I hope you understand born again. Somehow, the Church of England never got it. Somehow, the Church of England completely missed that line. And it became a blind spot in the Reformation. They simply did not grasp born again. Huh? That's, that's, that's crazy. <coughs> but they didn't. Okay? Now the majority of the... More than half of the 13 colonies were the Church of England. All the business ventures were the Church of England. The Anglican ministers in the Church of England taught, here was their doctrine... Moral goodness, comma, prayers, comma, and ethical, beha and ethical behavior. Moral goodness, prayers, and ethical behavior provide a sufficient passport to heaven. That's what the Church of England taught. They taught that moral goodness, prayers, and ethical behavior provided a sufficient passport to heaven. That was what you were taught if you were in the Church of England in 1730. That's what they understood. Purely good works. How did they miss Ephesians 2.9? Uh, it is not of works lest any man should boast. They missed it completely. Unbelievable, but that was what they were taught. So, by 1730... The Anglican colonies really weren't doing much with God because they never had. And the, the religious colonies had all gone into backsliding and comfort. And the 13 colonies were a very stagnant spiritual place in 1730. Now, if God truly had a plan for America... It was about time that he act. <laughs> and he did. Okay? And he did. In 1714, George Whitfield was born near London. Uh, <clears throat> in the 1700s in England, your social standing controlled your destiny. Social standing in England in 1700, your destiny was controlled by your level of social standing. Now, George Whitfield's grandfather had been a rich landowner. And so he had a very high social status. And he could do anything. I mean, he was, he was blessed and blessed and blessed. On the extreme other end of the social scale, way down in the bottom, were coal miners, many of whom actually worked naked and were treated no different than animals. I mean, that really was the, the social strata, way down to these miners and up to the gen, gentle people who did nothing. They just lived off wealth. 
And, and George Whitfield's grandfather had been one of those guys at the top. Uh, but his dad didn't do well. <laughs> his dad not only didn't do well, but he died young. Whew. And do you realize widows did not inherit? Widows did not inherit the husband's money. What? No. So George Whitfield's mother becomes a widow, and she has to become an innkeeper and rent rooms to survive. Innkeepers was one of the lowliest positions on the social strata. An innkeeper was a very lowly level of social uh, achievement. So young George Whitfield wants to get back into grandpa's category. How do I get back into the upper social strata? Well, the shortcut to the top was through the clergy. Be a preacher. That was a shortcut to a high status. You didn't have to have the money that Grandpa had. You could have the prestige by being a preacher. So George Whitfield decides when he's 17 or 18, one way or another, he's going to get to be a preacher. Not because of any conviction to God, but because he wants back up where Grandpa was in the social strata. Mother is able to finagle with somebody she knows a, a, an entrance to Oxford University. Oxford is perhaps the oldest university on the face of the earth, going back to 1100. Oxford is a religious school. It is not and was not then a spiritual school. It was just a religious school. Huh? Yeah. So, at 19, George Whitfield goes off to Oxford University, and he is put under the tutelage. Everybody was assigned a tutor. You did not go into a class with 32 other kids and open to chapter 13 and read. No. You went before your tutor, and he assigned you your workload for today and for next month. He assigned, you go study this. Come back with your report. That's how you went through Oxford. So, off, off George Whitfield goes to Oxford University. Oxford is a spiritual, no, is a religious university where men are becoming preachers but are known for drunk parties and visiting brothels. Yeah. That's what he walks into. You're going off to this religious college where the ministerial students are getting drunk and hanging out at brothels. That's where he goes. Now, when he gets there, he's assigned to two tutors, John and Charles Wesley. Both of these men are very righteous. They do not partake of the drinking or the brothels, they are both very holy in their living. They even have what they call the holy club. They have what they call the holy club. And George Whitfield joins that club. He's hoping to get back to the top. But George suddenly finds himself under very deep conviction Suddenly, he feels the need to really honestly serve God. Stay away from all these other guys that are going to the drunk parties and everything else and really serve God. Now, how does he do that? Through self-denial. He almost becomes a monk. I mean, he just gives up everything. He, just give, he, he quits eating. He, he, he gets sick because he won't even eat. He goes to the prisons. And he takes all of his food and everything he's got, and he gives it to the people at the prisons. Self-denial. He is trying to, because remember, he's in the Anglican church system, and, and, and moral behavior and good works is a passport to heaven. So he's doing all of this trying to get there. Now one day, in October, he's 
out walking when a woman he knows comes running up to him soaking wet in October. She's cold. She's jumped in the river, tried to drown herself. She tried to drown herself. She is the wife of one of the inmates that he's been visiting at the jail. She comes rushing to him when she sees him. She falls at his feet and apologizes, ashamed of herself, trying to kill herself when she's got kids at home. So he opens to her John chapter 3. And he begins to read to her the story of Nicodemus. And if you stay with the story of Nicodemus, you eventually come to John 3.16. That's in chapter 3, obviously. And he says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And the woman suddenly lights up and says, I believe. I do believe. I am saved. And Whitfield, in his own heart, goes, what? I mean, Whitfield has been trying to get saved by giving up everything, by denying himself everything, and this lady just comes along and says, I got it. I mean, to, to you and me, that makes no sense that that was a big barrier. But it hit him all of a sudden. All of my self-denial is nothing. Her simple faith has done it all. In a heartbeat, this lady got more than I've got out of months of self-denial. This lady has suddenly been born again. Now, that's unbelievable for us to think that that was so clouded in 1632 that, that, that that's what happened. But that is what happened in 1732. That's what happened to George Whitfield. Eventually, eventually, George Whitfield would lead both Charles and John Wesley to salvation. They were his teachers, but they weren't saved. He eventually became their spiritual father. Wow. God used that woman, God used that woman to change George Whitfield. Now, that incident happened when... Uh, he was first at college, and by 22, George Whitfield was ordained minister in the Church of England. He was an ordained minister in the Church of England, which we already know what their doctrine was. You didn't have to be born again. You only had to behave good. You know, all you had to do was moral living and uh, things of that nature, and you were, in fact, justified. That was sufficient moral goodness, prayers, and ethical behavior. But now he is a, an ordained minister in the Church of England. They called him the boy preacher. <laughs> he wasn't very big. He was a spindly little guy. <clears throat> he had really wanted to be an actor. He had wanted to be an actor, but an actor had no social status. So he gave up the thought of being an actor so he could get social status by being a preacher. But now that he's a preacher, he's an actor. Sermons in that day, hang on to this one, Cooper. <laughs> Sermons were two hours long. Many sermons had 28 to 35 main points. Huh? <laughs> 28 to 35 main points, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, two-hour sermons, and they were completely red. Generally emotionless, no emotion. Man stood behind the pulpit, read from a manuscript for two hours. Uh, the, uh, the, the sentinel went around with a cane tapping people that went to sleep. Yes. Now, George Whitfield. George wants to be an actor. <laughs> George has a handful of notes. He doesn't, he doesn't write his sermons out. He's got a handful of notes, and he's all over the platform. I didn't get that originally from him, but, <laughs> but he's all over the platform. 
It's against the law in England not to have a manuscript in 1734. Against the law not to have a manuscript. Uh, but he doesn't have a manuscript. And before long, he just gives up notes completely and is completely extemporaneous. He comes, on, comes to the pulpit and he just goes. People love him. England goes wild over George Whitfield. They love him. And every sermon is about the new birth. Every sermon, every sermon, he only focuses on one thing over and over and over again. He is always preaching the new birth and the Holy Spirit indwelling in a man's life. Well, he preaches that God is no respecter of persons. The king and the minor are equal before God. All right, so here's what one of the archbishops of the church said in regards to George Whitfield. He said, it is monstrous to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wrenches that crawl the earth. It is monstrous to be told that you have a heart that is as sinful as the common wrenches that crawl the face of the earth. So suddenly, no pulpits were open to George Whitfield. At first, everybody, everybody gave him their pulpit and let him preach. But as they became aware that he was declaring that they were not even born again, they, they began to bar him. He couldn't come. To, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't let him in. But the people loved him. The crowds were gigantic wherever he went. Well, he was barred from all the pulpits. And so he told John Wesley, he said, I am going to go preach to the miners. I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the, to the mine, and, I'm, and as I come out of the mine, I'm going to stand in the open and preach. It was against the law in England to preach in the open. You could not preach in the open. The reason for that was the potential of a riot that could start. So you had to be in a building. George Whitfield says, I don't care. I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach. He started preaching to the miners. Salvation began to happen. The law was going to arrest him, but he was so popular, they thought if they did arrest him, they would have a riot. Then, 1738, God told George Whitfield, you need to go to America. You need to go to America. George Whitfield loaded up. He headed to America. George, when he got to America, he rode north to south. Nobody went north to south. George Whitfield went north to south. All the travel had been east to west, but George Whitfield started at the top, rode to the bottom. Started at the bottom, he, he built an orphanage in Georgia. He went down at the bottom and he went all the way to the top riding horseback. He would ride horseback. They said they couldn't stop him in the worst rainstorm. He would ride anyway. He would ride anyway. Uh, he just kept riding. Uh, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, this is his quote. He was certainly the greatest preacher I ever heard. <laughs> George Whitfield was the greatest preacher I ever heard. He was sick. He would be so sick they would have to help him on his horse. But he would preach three times in the next 24 hours. Unbelievable. In, 19, in 1740, in one 75-day period in his journal, he traveled 800 miles horseback and preached 175 sermons. <laughs> yeah. In 75 days... He traveled 800 miles horseback and had 175 sermons. When Whitfield came to town, everything stopped. I mean, back and forth, up and down the colonies. Runners went ahead of him horseback and would, would holler out, Whitfield's coming. Whitfield will be here in two days. Whitfield's coming. Whitfield's coming. And every, everything stopped. Everything stopped. Everything stopped. Everything came to a standstill. The towns would quickly build a scaffold 12 to 15 feet high because that's what he would need, and it would be in a big open field, 
and he would go. I want to read to you. I know that this is hard to convey when, when you read. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do. But I want to read this page out of Whitfield to you. <clears throat> it, was, it, was, it was in the diary of a man named Nathan Cole. <clears throat> Nathan Cole, shortly before 9 in the morning on October 23rd, 1740, Nathan Cold was working in the fields when a horseman galloped by, calling out that Mr. Whitfield is to preach in Middletown at 10 o'clock. That's only an hour from now. Cole dropped his tools, ran to his house to get his wife, then ran to the pasture to get the horse. They're both going to ride one horse. He loaded on the horse, and whenever it labored too hard, he jumped off, eased his wife into the saddle and told her not to stop or slack up while he ran beside her. He would run until he was too out of breath and then he would mount again. They rode as if they were fleeing for their lives, all the while fearing that they would be too late to hear Whitfield preach. Every field they passed was deserted. Every man and woman was on their way to Middletown. When they... When they reached the high ground overlooking the road, they saw that it was covered with what looked like a fog. At first, Cole thought that it was a morning mist. But as they drew nearer, they heard a rumble like thunder and soon found that the cloud was a cloud of dust made by horses cantering down the road. The cloud rose high into the air, enveloping the trees. The horses within the cloud looked like shadows, a steady stream of horses with riders scarcely one horse length apart, one after the other. Cole slipped his horse into a vacant space. On they rode, not one speaking a word, until the cavalcade centered, cantered into Middletown, and Cole saw the space in front of the old meeting house on the edge of town was jammed with bodies. The Coles were in time. The ministers we're now moving across the green to the erected scaffold platform where Whitfield would preach. Cole saw ferry boats going back and forth to the other side of the river, bringing more people. The land and the banks over the river were absolutely black with people and horses. Whitfield came forward onto the platform. His looks was almost angelic, Cole thought. He was a young, slim, slender, slender youth, and thousands of people were obviously gathered to hear him preach. Cole said that hearing how God had been with this man solemnized his mind and put him into an almost trembling fear before the sermon began. For as I looked upon him, he said, he looked as if he spoke with authority directly from God. <laughs> imagine, imagine horses thundering down the road racing to get to town in time, hoping to get there before he was gone. Unbelievable. Uh, they list the birthday of the Great Awakening as October 1740. The official, perhaps, beginning. I've left out Jonathan Edwards. That's a whole different chapter. But Jonathan Edwards focused in one town. Whitfield was up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Historian Richard Nyberg says that the Great Awakening was America's national conversion. Whitfield died when he was only 56 years old in 1770. His preaching dissolved all cultural barriers. He leveled all the social positions. Slaves loved him. They stood next to governors to listen to him preach. His travels north and south broke down the barriers and inspired unity. We come to the end of his life. In 1770, <clears throat> his health was now broken. His breathing was tormented by asthma attacks. But he drove himself as never before. He reached Boston on his last visit on August 15th, 1770, five months after the British troops had fired into a mob of civilians 
Killing Five, the incident known thereafter as the Boston Massacre, had helped to create a hunger in the city for Whitfield's preaching. Never had the crowds been larger, nor the word received with greater eagerness than now. All opposition seems as if it were to have stopped. The next month found him in New Hampshire, where ministers of Exeter were begging him for a sermon. But when the time came, he could barely breathe. One of them said to him, Sir, you are more fit to go to bed than to preach. True, sir, he gasped. Then Whitfield, glancing toward heaven, added, Lord Jesus, I am weary in thy work, but I'm not weary of it. If I have not finished my course, let me go and speak for thee this one more time in the field and seal thy truth and then come home to die. The Lord granted his request. The entire district seemed to have converged upon the green that Saturday afternoon. At first, Whitfield could hardly be heard. His words were rambling as if he could not focus his mind. He stopped. He stood still. Minutes passed. And then he said, I will wait for the gracious assistance of God, for he will, I am certain, assist me once more to speak in his name. Then it seemed that he was rekindled by an inner fire. His voice now strong and clear, he preached for an hour with enormous power. On and on he went into the second hour and seemed to look right into heaven. He felt the pleasures of heaven in a raptured soul which made his countenance shine like an unclouded sun. Nearly two hours had passed when he suddenly cried out, I go, I go, I go to the rest prepared now for me. My son has arisen and by the aid of heaven has given light to many. It is now about to set. No, not about to set, but to rise to the zenith of, of the immortal glory. O oh, thought divine, I shall soon be in a world where time, age, pain, and sorrow are, are, are unknown. My body fails, but my spirit expands. How willingly I would ever live to preach Christ, but I die to be with him. And that night, he slept fitfully. Early in the morning, despite a crushing pain in his chest, he pulled himself out of his bed, made his way to the window, and died there watching the sun come up. A new day would soon break across the nation. His dream had now come true. America was a nation now. It was one nation under God. Unbelievable <laughs> how God used one, one man to bring 13 independent, unconnected, but 32 years, 32 years, up and down, up and down, up and down. He would preach and, and the ministers would get saved. <laughs> The ministers would get saved, they would catch the burden in the fire, and they would spread the revival. And that, my friends, was the Great Awakening. I never got that in school. <laughs> I never got that. I never had the feeling that that was the Great Awakening. Stand with me. The Great Awakening. What an enormous moment. An enormous moment. <clears throat> oh, Lord. Lord how you have used individual people to bring about great movements in the house of God. People who had grown up in church but never knew God, never knew Jesus, never knew salvation. Suddenly through George Whitfield, they were able to come to you, Lord, and be saved. And Lord, 13 individual rivalry colonies suddenly were sewn together in a fabric that became America. 
by the preaching of one man who rode thousands of miles north and south, north and south, through all kinds of weather, telling the story that Jesus can live in your heart. Oh, Lord, we're at a point in history where we need some people of God who would be willing to sacrifice themselves as Whitfield did. May your blessing rest upon your message in our hearts. May we be true believers. And if anyone does not know that beautiful gift of born again, may they come to know it, Lord, as simply as that drowning woman had. I believe, I believe. Oh, Lord, that we would believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I've got my resume.